We are in Parashat Vayechi. As you know, everybody always says, everything comes to an end. Good things, bad things, everything has an end. And Eita. Sefran Bereshit, the Chumash of Bereshit, started with what we call the Kilkul Aulam, with how the world uh, started to disintegrate and fall apart. And this week's parasha, Parashat Vayechi, is the, the parasha that seals the, the, you know, the, the chapter on Sefer Bereshit or Genesis. That's the last weekly portion of Sefer Bereshit. And that's the seal. So if that was the deterioration of the Olam, of the world, and this is basically, this, this parasha deals a lot with what the fixing of the world is all about. And we know that everything goes after, after the seal, until after whatever, you know, just like you have a contract or you have a letter, you know, it's all empty words until you actually sealed it. Sign, seal, delivered, I'm yours, as they say. So, we, therefore we need to look very carefully at what the seal of this parasha, of this week's parasha, is actually coming to teach us, and by doing so to understand that. So as we see further down, the journey that we are dealing here with, uh, with, the, with the parasha is a journey that goes from destruction to rebuilding. And we need to really internalize that. So basically it's the journey that takes us from the beginning of the world, from, the, from creation, from the first moments of creation until the tikkun ha'olam, fixing the world and the tools to fix this world. So uh, that parasha that we have here, the parasha that we did, parasha Yechi, is called in the Torah parasha stuma. Parasha stuma, that means that there's no gap in between the beginning to the end of the parasha, Right from the, from, I'm sorry, from the end of last parasha to this one, usually there's like a little gap. This one starts where the other one ends. And it says that it's called parasha stuma, according to Rashi. Rashi says the following, Lama parasha zustuma. Why this parasha starts differently? There's no tab. That the, in the Torah, there's no tab. It's just like a continuous paragraph. Why is that like that? So Rashi says, very interesting. Shekevan sheniftar Yaakov Avinu, since Yaakov, Jacob, died, nistemu einehem velibam shel Israel. The eyes and the heart of the Jews were sealed. That's very bizarre. I mean, what, they lost a prescription or something? I mean, what does it mean, nistemu einehem shel Israel? So we know that, what does it mean? It means that their eyes were closed and they didn't even feel, they weren't aware that the, the oppression, that what we call the Shi'abud, the oppression has already started and they start to become slaves. In other words, they became dependent, they became, you know, they didn't take the necessary steps to really check all the time, are we free or are we not free? Which is a question that you should all ask yourself. Am I really free? Or is it just an illusion that I'm being portrayed with all the time that I have freedom but I actually don't? How much freedom do you really have in your life? How much freedom do you have in your mind? How much of your thoughts are your own thoughts. How much of your ideas are your own ideas? Needless to say, values or virtues, because today there's no such thing as values and virtues. There's no such thing as privacy and private things anymore. If in you know, years ago, 30, 40 years ago, even the concept of, of sexuality was hidden. It wasn't hidden because people were not having fun or whatever it was. It was the certain thing should not be a public matter. 
and deterioration that we have together with that is the downfall of our society. We're not slaves, but we sure are becoming slowly slaves. And I'm just not talking about COVID and this and that. I'm talking about the way of our life, the way we live our lives. We're not free. And many times we put ourselves in that jail. And we need to really stop, stop, before it's too late. And once you go into, your, into this jail that you created to yourself, ain't no coming out of there. Mm -hmm. And we need to realize it. So we need to really be careful how do we determine what we are determining here. So until Yaakov Avinu died, everything was fine. As soon as he died, what we call spiritual darkness has started to come down on the world. Ideas are not clear. The light, the livelihood. You know, I remember. You guys don't remember. You weren't even carrying around, if you know what I mean. But in the 60s, in the 70s, even in the lousy 80s, there was something that was missing today, and that's called hope. Today, you ask people, there's like no desire to really live. There's no hope for a better day tomorrow. Let's just like try to, let's try to get whatever we can now. Because there's really no hope. As they say, eat and drink because tomorrow we'll die. You can listen to music. Music of the 60s and the 70s, even the 80s. There's certain hope in that. And together with lack of hope, there is a deterioration of values and virtues in our society. So when Yaakov Avinu was alive, the, you know, the darkness, the, the sun did not start to set. But the darkness of exile and oppression has started to rise up. That cloud, the black, uh, black, great black cloud, right, as they say in the knock on heaven's doors. The black right cloud is coming down. I feel I'm knocking on heaven's door. But doors are not opening. If you want to sing along later on, we can sing or knock, knock on heaven's doors later, but no, not right now. Now that Yaakov is dead, all of a sudden there are different voices that are coming up from the house of Paro. Paro is talking about there's a different language. Slowly, slowly, we are not so welcome in that empire that we felt so great there. We need to really pay attention to what Rashi says, this Temuin Em Velipam, the eyes and the hearts of Israel was closed. It's not something that they immediately they became slaves. Yosef was still alive. Yosef was still the ruler. He was still the head honcho in, in Egypt. But their perspective started to change. Their clarity of sight has been distorted. They start to bribe themselves why they're doing what they're doing and, and, and so on and so forth. Their, their vision got destroyed. They lost sight. And because the, the, the lost sight, the heart slowly, slowly started to close. And of course, B'nai, B'nai Israel were more fruitful and multiplied. And they continue with their quote-unquote regular life, as they say. But the connection to the neshama, to the soul, has started already to deteriorate. It's already started to become weak. And it's not like it used to be today. And, it's, and it is almost like we have it today. I mean, Am Israel can live freely in, you know, you know, free life. You can go and practice and so on and so forth, Judaism, without, but you can do so without really remembering the source. What is this all about? Where are you coming from? Where are you heading? And so on and so forth. And slowly, slowly, you know, you're forgetting about, you're forgetting about all the source and you forget about the Rebona Shalom because he's the source of everything. And, and the real freedom is the way you're connected to God and before you know, you're a slave. All of a sudden, you're a slave. And that is by allowing the koach, the power of the klipah, the husk of Mitzrayim to be midgaber, slowly, slowly, you find yourself in darkness, like people are falling asleep in the middle of the day on a bench in the, in the thing, right, guys? What are you doing, guys? Stay up. Because you might fall asleep in the middle of the morning. You don't know if you're ever going to wake up. 
So, and that parasha is called Parashat Vayechi because together with the Yerida, through that oppression of Egypt, all of a sudden we find this, the enormous force of revival. The power that Yaakov Avinu had, and then let's try to see exactly what, what happens and how is this is really has to do with our lives here and now. So in order to get out of a certain place, it's very important to remember which door you entered. If you know anything about navigation, rule number one. So, knowing how you got to this place to begin with. By the way, you know, they say that the strength really is derived from the place in which you're most broken. By the way, you know who said that? Ernest Hemingway. A guy like the Ecaries. But, uh, hey, listen, it's absolutely true. So through the darkness of Egypt, that's where the revival of us come. So we need to know where we're coming and how do we enter and so on and so forth. And that's what it says in the parasha. It says, Vayachal Yaakov let at banav. And then he, he stopped commanding them what to do. And he, and he gathered his legs together to, to, to the bed. And he, and he basically died. So Rashi says, Umita lo rabo. He says, Ne'esaf, he was gathered to his people. He didn't say he, was, he died. So Chazal says, Yaakov Avinu lomet. They say that Yaakov did not die. Of course, there is a contradiction here because we know Yaakov was died. Yaakov was, was, uh, Yaakov was, uh, was uh, mummified and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you see there's a certain danger. that. But Chazal says, what do you mean he's not dead? So of course, to understand it, there are different ways to understand it. So in... in uh, in everything in life, also in death, there is a concept of externalism and internalism. Chitzoniyut or pnimiyut. So the chitzoniyut is how things evolve, or things happen, and so on and so forth. So yes, Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov died. You know, he stopped living. He, he, he died, right? But from, from the tzad of himself, Yaakov Avinu is not dead. What does it mean? And, uh, and of course, there's many different levels. And what, what the, the Tana says in, in the Gemara, that Zir'o shel Yaakov chai, chai et kol orech agalut, the, the descendants of Yaakov, his zera, the continuation of his action continues all through exile also, altogether until etzem ayom azeh. So the fact that Yaakov Avinu went down to Mitzrayim and his children went down to Mitzrayim is still a continuation of that act. We, we still practice that to them. We all sit here in exile. Therefore, Yaakov Avinu is still considered to be Chai, how? Bezar'o, with his descendants, still, his DNA is still in each and every one of us. So he's still alive. There's another, another approach to that, is the Baal Shem Tov says that Yaakov Avinu reached such a level that the Torah is called Yaakov, the actual Torah is called Yaakov. And we know that Yaakov is the, the chariot, is the vehicle for the sphera of Tiferet. Right? The Tiferet is right in the center. And that is the Kav Emtsai. That center line, the Kav Emtsai is also called Amud Ve'yesod Torah, The central column of Torah. And for that it says, Yaakov in Ulomet, Hainu Sheha Torah Nitzchit. The Torah is eternal. Since that representative of Yaakov, so therefore Yaakov Avinu is, is, is alive. The Torah is eternal. Ve'ina betela le'olam. That look at the Baal Shem Tov. Of course, there is another explanation. If you want to look, there's a very interesting story in Masechet Shabbat, in Daf Lamed, Abud Aleph, regarding this whole entire thing. One way is that Yaakov Avinu, and that's, that's, that's maybe one way to understand when we talk about tzaddikim b'mitatam nikraim chayim, when, when righteous people die, they're still considered to be alive. Because when they say something, they said, you know, Divrei Torah. I mean, when Moshe Rabbeinu was alive, listen, we complain about the guy left and right all the time. Once he died, his words, his Torah, it's called Torah Moshe. Why? Because we were able to separate the image of the person from his words, and now the words are truthful and so powerful that they stand by themselves, so they're still kind of echoing in our, in our ears. So that's another way... Of course, that's another way to look at that. Yaakov Avinu was the tikkun of Adam Arishon. He came here to fix, to show us the way, how to fix what Adam Arishon had, had done. He had, of course, the looks of Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon, Adam, right? 
the guy who, Adam and Steve, right? Adam brought death to the world. He's the one who caused death to come to the world. Uh, after Etzadat, after he, he, uh, he did the sin, he ate the apple, right? All of a sudden, death was decreed upon, upon the world. Because it says, Ki beyom ochlecha motamut, the day you're going to eat it, you're going to die. So you ate, so now as a result of that, there's always cause and effect. You ate it, so now you die. That's, that's what it is. You didn't want to die, you didn't have to eat it. It's very simple. So Yaakov is the revival, is the tchia of the world. And that's what it is in the way there is a, a closure in this parasha. We started with the death and we started and we're going back into life all the way to Yaakov Avinu. So, and, and Yaakov Avinu is, we don't use the word chai to Yaakov Avinu until this point. It is coming down to Mitzrayim. Because it says, Vayechi Yaakov be'eretz Mitzrayim. And Yaakov was alive, Vayechi was alive, Chayut, Chai, alive in Eretz Mitzrayim. Now, the numerical value of 17 in Gimatria is top. Is top. And it says, Bnei Yisrael Yadu Mitzrayim. They came to Mitzrayim to bring about the Nitzotzo, the sparks that were left there. How long did Yaakov Avinu live in Mitzrayim? <coughs> 17 years. Gimatriato. He came in to do good. In other words, there were holy sparks that were hidden in Egypt, and they, they said, came to bring it up. They came, and where those sparks were? The, the sparks that Adam Rishon that separated from his wife for 130 years, and, and, he, and, he, and it's known that the Avon of Keli, of Shvichat Zera Levatala, is something that it's considered to be, it's called Ra, Davar Ra. And if you take the word, for example, Paro, oh, how do you spell Paro? Pei. So you take Po, Po, two extremes, Pei, Hei, Paro, Ra. Here is bad. Came Yaakov, and it's a lesson to us, takes the, the good. And he's able to bring it out because since in the bed there, those klipot were captured there, he needs to bring them back to its source. He takes the bad and he's trying to make it good. And that's a big lesson to us to do as well. That has to do with the community that we had and that has to do with ourselves as well. We need to remove that par off from us. We need to remove those those, those, and, and what, what happened during those 130 years, as we said before? Adam separated from Chava. So the law, evil, does not manifest itself better than in the process of separation. Those people who create separation are ra, are bad, are evil, are wicked. They are the representation of bad in the world. Bad in the world comes from separating. Those who do divide and conquer, these are the people who implant bad in the world. That's why when a person goes between, a, you know, puts his wedge between a husband and wife, it's supposed to be a representation of a divine unification, is, is considered to be a horrible thing to separate a house. When, a, when you break a house, it's like you're burning the Bet Amikdash all over again. And so on and so forth. Those people are the repre representative of evil in the world. And that evil is dangerous because you know if a guy goes, you know, you know whatever, you know, a Nazi, okay, you know, it's a tempest. But a guy that would look to you like one of you is an enemy between us. He's a fifth color. You don't know how to watch out for him. And he goes and he divides and breaks apart. These are descendants of the Klippa. The whole concept of Abraham Avinu is to bring unity together. To bring it back to the source. To separate between good and bad. To bring the good, to identify the good and bring it back to where it came. That's what, that's what Yaakov Avinu said. 
And Yaakov Avinu understands that. And of course, he has 12 kids. And what he does, instead of, I mean, you would think, Yaakov Avinu, man, you should have learned that. You showed everybody you like yourself better. So don't show any preferences over one over the other. Give everybody equal bracha. Stand in front of them, do like this, you know. Give everybody the same bracha. No. Yaakov Avinu goes and understands different. He says, I'm going to make sure that you're going to do so because to Yehuda he gives Malchut, to this one he gives this one, to that one he gives a different bracha. All of you together need to understand you need to take whatever bracha I'm giving you and put it together because we need each and every one of you. Don't think that you got all the bracha, you got all the power, you can do everything. It's Yitzchak understood that and he wanted to make Yaakov and Esau go together. Yaakov understood that. That's why you give each one a different bracha. Each one complements the other. The, the great avon, the great sin of Pelegesh Bagivah, Am Israel cried, not because of the horrible thing that was just done, but because almost a whole Shevet was, was, was erased from the history of Am Israel, a whole tribe. And if one tribe would be lost, the whole thing is over. We can never fix it. We can never fix it. So that's why we have to stand against those who try to break apart, to put a wedge. Those who connive and go under and talk behind your back, and that's the whole problem of Lashonar and gossip, of untruthful people. And we need to understand that those people make the darkness greater. They make the exile last longer. And they need to be eradicated in such a way that to bring them back to the good, we need to put pressure on them. We need to show presence of good over bad. More good over bad. If you feel, that's another perush. When we see, remember, we said in the morning, if a person sees she yitzro mit gaber alav, ilbash chorim v'ilech l'makom acher and do whatever he needs to do. So I have a new chidush for you. If a person, a person sees that his yetzer is too much for him, is overcoming him. In other words, he's in a place that is full of yetzer hara. Wear your back clothes. In other words, go stealth without the yetzer hara knowing that you're gone. Move to another place and do what you need to do. Because this battle, you're going to lose. Mit gaber alav, it overcome you. We always translate, we explain it in a manner of like, okay, go whatever you do, you know, relieve yourself and then it's going to be good. I'm showing you, no, it's a different way to do so. I'm showing you the way of to make it a tikkun. And that's a, that's a new concept. So we know that in the, in the historical, in the historical uh, uh, reality that it's overpassing and so on and so on, we know the Mitzayim was a land of great impurity, tremendous kishuf, magic, idol worshipping, immoral relationship, a place that it's like all goes. It all goes. It's all legal. It's all goes. Do whatever you want. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. And in a place like that, it's called Mitzrayim because it's Meitzer. Meitzer, Meitzarim, it's called straits. In a strait, you know, you could really close, close the straits and you create a blockade. That's it. You're done. So Mitzrayim, in a place like this, you might think, what's it? what are you talking about? Freedom. You want to smoke a pot? Smoke a pot. You can smoke a frying pan if you want. Doesn't have to smoke just pot. You want to marry a cat? Marry a cat. You want to marry a dog? Marry a dog. Who cares? You know, you all go free for all. You don't understand. That's just an illusion. Because when you have no boundaries, you don't have any room to maneuver. So you're basically not going anywhere. It's like. You are, instead of, instead of, of having, let's say, a nice V8 engine with good traction tires, 4x4, four four, you can go. But instead of that, you are wearing, uh, you know, uh, you know glass, glass soles on a lake that is all frozen. You, know, you can't go anywhere. It's all free. Go whatever you want. No, no friction. No boundaries. 
If you want to know what driving without boundaries is, go ahead. Go take the, the bear pass, black bear pass in Colorado. No boundaries. You're going to be flying all the way down. Boundaries are good. They allow your ability to maneuver. You need some discipline. You need structure in your life. When you have no structure, no discipline, you go nowhere. Nowhere. Everybody wants the parents tell you, don't have to, you don't have to get up in the morning, whatever you want. You don't want to get up when you're at one o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, two o'clock. Don't have to work, don't have to do anything. You're going to become a monster. In order to grow, you need boundaries. It's I gave you this freedom, but took away your liberty. And then we need to understand that. And Mitzrayim is a place, and together with this freedom, the spiritual reality is that by doing this free-for-all attitude, the light of the Kedusha, of the holiness, goes away. Can't stay here. There's no vessel to contain it. See, if there's no vessel to contain it, there's no Kedusha, there's no holiness. So it goes away. And that's called Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum shel asechel ledvarim ketanim. Man is not, when, when you are so free to do whatever you want, you're not going to think of great things. You're going to think about all the things that you wanted to do that, you know, mommy told you not to do and, or society told you not to do. And then you become small. I mean, and you, you want examples? I'm going to tell you, there's no examples. There's no example. I mean, there's a very simple example. The example is like this. When was the last time you saw any thinkers that come out recently? in recent years, in the last 20 or 30 years. Where are the great theories of, 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 let's say, psychology? Where are the new Piagets, the new Freuds, the new Margaret Mahlers? Where are the great thinkers? Any philosophers lately? You go to the liberals in colleges, there's nobody there. Just like a couple of dingbags professors waiting, catching up, you know, you know, I don't know, uh, doing macrame on, on, on spider webs. Nobody's learning liberal arts, and that's a mistake. Everybody wants money. Nobody wants to grow. So together with that, it goes down. And a person who is free, a free man, is a man that his mind could really grasp the whole reality. He understands what reality is all about. He understands about physics. He understands about music. He understands it. All of a sudden things make a lot of sense to him. That's why when you don't want to learn and you don't want to grow and you don't and you, all you want to do is, hey, listen, guys, there's nothing wrong by having like, you know, a little pina colada somewhere in the, uh, you know, in uh, whatever you call it, in the, in the, in the, in the keys you know, going to uh, one of those islands, drinking some uh, daiquiris, you know, watching the sunset, or buy a fireplace, you know, somewhere upstate New York where there's like two feet of snow with a nice bourbon, distilled, bottle, bottled, and, uh, and uh, you know, in, in the same place, not somewhere, you know, what, you know what I'm saying? From time to time, from time to time, it's okay. But you really need to be on the progress all the time forward. So, so a person that understands this reality, he understands all these things, he knows about, he's a cultural man. He knows about music, he knows about classical music, he, can, he knows philosophy. Maybe not an expert in everything, but sure has the knowledge. That's a free man, because you're able to grasp reality. When you understand reality, you're free to do whatever you want. You're able to enjoy whatever you want. When was the last time you sat down and you listened to some, I don't know, some baroque composer, you know, like with some classical guitar or some, you know, Paganini or whatever it is? No, for you to listen to good music is what, you know, just like something that sounds like boom, 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 like stuff like that. Your ability to enjoy many things, a variety of things, and understand the logic behind it, if you, for example, sit down and you take music theory, argument sake, you understand music theory, all of a sudden you're going to really appreciate and understand music and musicians. 
it will take a totally different reality for you. Needless to say, if you understand Torah, which is the blueprint of the world, and that's why it says, "En ben chorim ela misheosek b'Torah." The Torah gives you an ability to grasp reality with sharp, with such such sharpness, and that's where you become free. Not because you can do whatever you want. Freedom comes from discipline. Yes, it's kind of an oxymoron, but it's not. Now you think about, now I'm giving you some measurements to really, you know, measure how free you really are. I mean, for crying out loud, if I'm going to give you a, 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 a map, a topographic map, and a, and, a, and a compass, I don't think that most of you can find a way out of a paper bag. I told my wife the other day, I said, I really miss paper maps. I like it, it's good. Why? Because I see the whole entire thing. I know how it works. GPS is, 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 a, is confining your brain, makes you small. It just shows you, go here, in 300 feet, make a left. At the roundabout, take the second exit on the right. You just see this, you don't see where you're going. GPS. How about a regular map? Right? So, in, in, uh, when you're able to, to really, as they say, know so much about things, and that was the greatness of Adam Rishon, he was able to understand, to see Mikseh Olam he knew everything, he knew all the animals, what's the names and what, and so on and so forth. So all your, all your thoughts are expanding, but when your machshavot, when your thoughts are really only focused on physical things, on little things, on what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to drink and who I'm going to multiply with, you live in tzimtzum, you live in, in a condensed manner, you can grow, you can have a thought, you cannot become a philosopher, you, for crying out loud, you know why there are no thinkers anymore? Because nobody thinks. Everybody listen to uh, the you know media and get their opinions and that's it. They bring some moron expert, and now you able to say what he says, and now you think you're an expert also. Ask the same words as the expert said, and don't think he's any different in the world of Torah. Unfortunately, there's no desire for many people, not though everybody has a shalom, to only become superficial. And we get very carried away by the fact that the guy is able to say, he said this one, this rabbi said this one, the other one said this one, this one said this one, and it says in this page, and said that. You know, I told you how I call this. I call it Torayaki. Like karaoke, Torayaki. You sing it along. There's no death. If you know what I mean. So next time you're mesmerized by a guy that knows everything by heart, think about how shallow you are. When was the last time you really thought a deep thought about the meaning of things, the reasoning of things, and so on and so forth? And everything is, it's choking everything. And that's also the, if you look at Paro, right? Paro is also what we call, if you take the letters and mix them up, is Haoref. Haoref means your neck, your throat, your neck. Now, if you're going to look at those uh, few parashiot that we were talking about, his three uh, top aides of Paro was not Jared Kushner and so on and so forth. It was somebody other. Who were they? They were Sarah Tabachim, Sarah Ofim, and Sarah Mashkim. It was about the head butcher, the guy who makes all the food, the guy, everything is through the, through the throat. Everything is associated with throat. And what did Paro say? It's all about chenek, all stayed in. It's all about how we're going to make the people choke. To tighten everything. Can I give you more taxes? I'm going to take away your, your mortgage that you can't pay? I own your house. All of a sudden you find the government becoming the biggest landlord in the world. Right? That's the concept of Pagao. Now we also know that in the moach, in the head of the person, there are three parts. There's moach yamin, which is chokhmah. 
and the and the and the left uh, left lobe, which is connected bina, right? That's how you understand things. And then chokma is the skills goes to the left, right, and so on and so forth. Then you have the what we call the moachem tzayi or the frontal lobe, which is really the dot. Makes sense. Now that dot olechu mitpashet because you can have a good frontal lobe. I mean, a good uh, right lobe and uh, left lobe. But if your frontal lobe is, is all messed up, you know, it's like yo, yo, waste of a person. So that's the dot, that's the middle, that's right right here. That's why person goes, do bangs it. So the internal abundance goes through the dot. The external gashmi, the materialistic abundance, goes through the pe and the garon, to the mouth and to the throat. So when you are getting intellect, you're reading, it goes through your to the way you process your information, right? How you're able to rationalize things to the frontal lobe. And anything that you need for the nourishments of your body goes through your mouth, through your throat. Derech paro, sara tabachim, sara ofim, sara mashkim. He closed it like this. And he didn't want it to go down. He didn't want the physical body to enjoy that. Now, inside the, the neck, we also have the, the kaneve veshet. We have the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, no, the esophagus and the uh, trachea, and there's also and they also uh, there also veins inside and, and arteries and so on and so forth, and those those three sarim saratabachim simply restricted everything, and therefore the chasimah that closure closure again that Mitzrayim did in the straits of your neck, right, was also from the back. And from the front, it was completely. And in a place like this, there's no place to go for any spirituality. So what did they do? It's very interesting. By restricting the physical body, eventually they prevented any kind of wills to live or strive for freedom. That's why Bnei Israel didn't want to leave Mitzrayim, because there was a, a disconnect because of the hard work. And by the way, making, making uh, bricks, it's a very difficult work. It's a back-breaking job to make bricks with, you know, and so on and so forth. So by the hard work, by the little food, by the humiliation that they suffered, they prevented them from thinking about freedom. Now think about what you've been told that you need to do in order to success. You need to work hard. Yes, you are. You need to work hard. But you need to have a balance. If you're going to work 16 hours a day, don't tell me you're going to think about spirituality. You're going to think about going to sleep. You need to some discharge. You want to see what things they are? We made ourselves slaves to our work. And this little power is sitting on top of our heads, telling us, work, you lazy poops. Oh, work, 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 work. Where's the time to take off? Sit down. Learn. Spend some time with your wife. I didn't say a whole day. Don't need to do her nails. Sit down, half an hour with your wife. Talk about things. 45 minutes with your wife. Come to yeshiva. Learn. Enrich yourself. Expand your, your thinking. Increase your point of view in the world. Become knowledgeable. All of a sudden, you're going to make brave decisions in your life. So, that is, when, when things are so restrictive and you have a lot of work, what happens to you? You simply become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The size of the height of a person in the Torah world is not, uh, is measured between the distance between heaven and earth, between where is that? To, you know. And it is ability of a person to be able to create a balance between those two multiple things. Between his earthy needs, whatever they would be, to provide food, shelter, you know, maintaining the, the body, and also to create a balance to nourish his soul. When you do that, you create a lot of layers you become taller, you become bigger, 
And that, your ability to create that balance will determine how strong you would be. Strength comes from balance. If you are, for example, very, very strong in your upper body, but your legs are like twigs, I don't know, you're going to throw a punch, you're going to fly. Or first thing I go, I'm going to go after your feet. You need to be balanced. There's a certain ratio. You need to be well proportioned. And look at those people who are bodybuilders. They make these like crazy muscles. It's not proportioned. And we admire those lack of proportions. And the way we like, with certain figures we like, when everything is big, and big here, and big there, and big there, to the point that we're doing tummy tucks, and we're putting silicone here, and silicone there, and we put some bachelism in our lips. I mean, you got to be out of your mind. It shows something that you are really, something that's bad is happening to you, and it's creating imbalance, and then because of this imbalance, you're becoming weak. And we are weak, because we're not balanced. And also... The height of a person is measured by, his, by the distance that he has from those earthy things and his closeness to Shamayim. Komat Adam. And you see, so when you learn Masechet Chagiga, when he talks about the different spaces, the different, it doesn't just talk about space per se in terms of, of, of miles or thousands of miles and so on and so forth. In terms of the gap, the spiritual gap between, the, between different worlds, and different things. That's what we learned. Remember, we learned this in the Chagiga. So what happened was, we call it Mitzrayim is a place of Galut, of exile, which is a place which is also exists inside of us, a place which is far, dark, and foreign to us. Yaakov, Petesh, took the Aleph. Now Aleph, the letter Aleph, has a tremendous meaning to it. If you want to know what Aleph represents, or any letter, look at the first time it appears in the Torah, at the beginning of the world, and learn about what it means. So where is the first time we have Aleph in the Torah? Okay. Elohim. So he took the Aleph of Elohim. No, it starts the word, not in the middle. He took the Aleph of Elohim, and he brought this to Egypt. That's why he sent Yehuda. He said, before I go there, open me a place to learn. I don't care about money. If I'm going to be settling down there, I need a place to learn. I don't care about money. I need a yeshiva. So he took the Aleph of Elohim to the Gola. And when you bring Elohim, Elohim, the word Elohim to the Gola, you get Geula, redemption. Because again, there is no Ben Chorim Ela Misha Asak Torah. If you don't learn Torah, you are a slave. Not only are you a slave, you're a slave of slaves. Because again, Elcha ben Chorim, Ela Misha Asad Torah. You're only free when you learn Torah. Because you bring a God into your life. And God says, listen, I don't care what your boss says, I tell you, you don't work on Shabbat. Now, you might come with excuses why you should. Bottom line is, you took God out of your life at that moment. And Lemad Abadome, it's like, a, it's like the famous mashal that we had, the famous story that we had, that a king took his, uh, took his son and wanted to teach him a lesson. So he told his uh, vizier, you know, whatever, his uh, advisors, they can put him in a dark room, no windows, no light, no nothing. Kid is crying, crying, ah! Finally, the king says, okay, bring that candle, scandal, one candle. You know, bring a candle to the room. Broke a candle to the room, and all of a sudden the kids say, oh my goodness, there's a lot of good stuff here. There's some sushi, caviar, gold, jewelry, whatever I need. How come I didn't see it before? Because you were in darkness. You need to bring the light into a place of darkness. So, and we need to, and the father, the father, the king, wanted to give it to him. But he wanted the kid to really understand what it is first of all not to have it and then to have it that's why if you do have a business and I hope one day you guys have a business and Be'er Shot Hashem you're all going to have baby boys also among girls but also baby boys Amen Amen that's a very weak Amen Amen you're going to make sure that the first thing if you really love your son it's the first thing you do you don't let it work for you 
that work for somebody else. Because he would not understand how good it is to work for daddy until he had a boss that whipped him. Daddy comes to daddy and daddy says, oh, wow, daddy is great, I love you. But if you're going to let your son in, right out of college, your son at best would wait to do a hostile takeover. Needless to say, he's going to wait for the day you're going to die and throw you out of there so you can take over the business. Go work for somebody else. Go break plate. Go, go clean bathrooms. <coughs> then come to work for daddy. Go see how it is. Go work hard. So he wanted to give it to him. But in order for him to appreciate what he has, got to take it away from him first of all. By being taken away, just close his eyes. Don't just open your eyes, see what it is. And that's something that we need to understand. Chazal tells us, so is HaKadosh Baruch Hu did the same thing to us. He put us in a dark place. He put the neshama into, into the body, in a place, the body is something that helps us run away from reality. person doesn't understand what you're doing here. And because you don't understand what you're doing here, what's the purpose of things because you don't want to think about it? it becomes difficult for you. And when it becomes difficult to you, you suffer instead of understanding. And that's the ma'ala of what we read of the Rabbi Nachum Gamza. He understood. And that's what we say, call the Abid Rachamadar and Tavavid. Everything Hashem does is for the best. Or as Rabbi Nachum Gamza said, Gamzulatama, this is also good. If you have a purpose, you understand. If you don't have a purpose, you suffer. There's such suffering in the world, no problem, I can fix it two ways, two, two seconds. How? Have meaning in your life. When you have a meaning in your life, you're not suffering. Because if you have to work for no meaning, going to work, you have to suffer. But if there is a purpose for you working, it's not suffering. You have a mission. You have a reason to get up in the morning. You have a reason to take care of yourself. And we need to understand that. And it's not just, for example, coming to show putting your talit on, praying to God, and just folding the talit and going out. Even coming to shul has to be a meaning. You, as a rabbi, have to make it meaningful for the people to come. It's not just about countering and chazanut and, 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 and stuff like this. Oh, you want, I can listen to better people, I can listen to Pavarotti, I'll enjoy it more. But it's about greater things than that. It's about meaning, purpose, mission. If you don't have it, you suffer. You have it? It's a totally different story altogether. So when there is a, a goal to reach, right, you need to work hard to, to reach it. And sometimes, as we say, meaz yet samatok, you take you take for example olives. Olives are bitter. So you put what do you put in you you cut them, you wash them, and then what do you do? You put salt, I mean salt and, and, and uh, lemon on them. And what happens? The bitterness comes out and then the olives become sweet. You have to know the process. There is a process to make something work. And that we need to be committed to this process as well. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to give you the reward. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is no, uh, is no, is no social security. It's not a politician. Thank God. Thank God for God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, listen, I'll give you all the reward and more. But you've got to labor. You've got to toil. You gotta do something for it. And what I want you to do is, first of all, you know, give some meaning and understand what you're doing, what you're doing. And you have to remember the source. That call all the kohot, all the powers, all your abilities came from him. You have to remember your father in the heavens. You have to remember Akadosh Baruch. Hu. Avinu Malkeinu. He's a God. He's a father. He's our king. We have to know that the light will come. And we're living in a good place. And sometimes it's dark, but it's actually a good place. And we need in the dark place. I mean, you don't put you don't put your your uh, your jewelry and stuff like this in like out in the open. You put it on the window for everybody to see. You put it in a safe in a dark place with no light and something like this, right? Sometimes the greatest treasures are in a dark place. But we need to simply be able to turn the light on. And we need to understand that in everything that we do, we need to bring 
God's life in it, whether it's in your work, whether it's in your relationship with your, with your spouse, in everything that you do, you need to bring the Akadosh Baruch, you need to bring God in as your partner. He is the source of light. You do it without it, you are in darkness. Maybe you'll get some glimpse of light from, from, from past generations or from past activities that you did, but the further you're going to go into life, the darkness you will be. That's where you're going to get very bitter old men, old people, because the light simply faded. But if you bring the light all the time, you're not even afraid to die because you know you're going to God. There's a purpose. I live my life, full life with a purpose. There's a totally different way to live life. Bring God to every aspect of your life. Make sure that everything that you do in life is something that God would say, I'm proud of this boy. I'm, I'm, it's my son. I'm, I'm proud of him. You need to evaluate your actions. Each one of us needs to turn his own also private Egypt, private Mitzrayim, to a revival. In such a way, a continuous motion, even the greatest Tum'ah, we're not going to be able to get a hold. Because we saw, you know, you know that, right? There is no moss growing on rolling stones. Because it's always moving. So, and the greatest Tum'ah of all is death. And if a person really put the meaning and brought this light to his life, even after his death, it's called a life. Because look at the Rambam. How many times we mentioned the Rambam a day? How many times we mentioned, you know, the words of this one, of this Tana, of this Rabbi, of this one? So even death is not, you're, you're physically dead, but you're spiritually alive. People who don't do that are physically alive, but spiritually dead. The Tum'ah of a Met, Tum'at Met, the impurity of a dead person, is a closure of all the lights. All the lights. And the only way to be mevatel, to cancel those, that closure of death, is to bring about Tudchiyat Amitim, the resurrection of the dead. Yaakov Avinu was able to do so. You know, he still, he experienced his own Tudchiyat Amitim. He's speaking from my mouth. When you mentioned the Rambam, you said the Rambam said it's a personal experience of resurrection of the because the Rambam is speaking now through my mouth, but the Rambam is speaking, or the Rashba is speaking through my mouth. So in a way, the Rambam spiritually is alive. Physically is dead. But spiritually is alive. That's one of the reasons we also say Kaddish, to continue and so on and so forth. And whenever you make your calculations about should I do this, I shouldn't do this, I should take this job, I shouldn't take this job, I should, you know, and so on. Think about one thing and one thing only. Purpose. What's the purpose of what I'm doing? What's the purpose of all this? Is there a purpose for that? Money is not a purpose. Money is means. It's not a goal. It's not a purpose. So it's like a person that his goal is to get, I don't know, a Corvette 1962 Stingray baby blue coil convertible. Well, finally you got it. Okay, now what? Now he's dead? These are foolish things. Everything. Ask, what's the goal? What's the purpose? Why am I doing so? And so on and so forth. And that's what Paro wanted to do. So more work, more taxes, more taxes, more insults, more so, and, and, and why? So you will stop to exist. Sometimes we do experience it also. I'm going to make your life miserable. I'm going to, not going to give you the freedom to learn. I'm going to close your kitchen. I'm not going to give you water. I'm not going to do you this. I'm going to make your life miserable. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you do this. Don't do that. Talk behind your back. Undermind you. So I'll say, okay, fine, you know that, no, we'll do it, yeah, it's right, we're out of here. Every one of us has an idea what freedom is all about. What does it mean to be free? But according to, according to Chazal, is the movement of life to go from one end to ability to go from one end to another in order to reach the koach 
the ability, the strength of revival so much that you will be free. Even a dead person could be free. And the, we are in the restriction of telephones, cell phones, computers, media, regulations, and so on and so forth. Break away from that. Break away from that. You get up in the morning, try to make yourself a deal with yourself. Not a deal with yourself, try to do it like this. The first 45 minutes, you know what, the first half hour after you wake up, don't touch your phone. Don't touch your phone. Have a certain morning routine that does not involve looking at the phone. Because you're a slave for your phone. And before you know, oh my goodness, I didn't eat, I didn't die, I, I gotta go catch a train, I gotta go to work, I don't have time. Look what you did to yourself. First 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Make yourself a routine. You know, get up in the morning, wash your hands, get dressed, go like this, go downstairs, make a coffee, you have to take pills, take your pills, you want to take vitamins, take your vitamins. You know, do this, prepare your food, go, go take your feeling, go like this. Uh, you know what? Until you go to shul, after you're done with shul, if you go to shul, don't forget when you go to shul, please put your masks on. Don't joke around with the masks. Put it on. It's a big deal. I mean, most of you are not so good looking anyway. Well, of course, it's truly here, but you know. So make yourself a deal from the time you get up in the morning until you're done dominating, thank you. Until you're done dominating, oh, you look so much better. It looks like you have a beard now. It's black, you know, it's nice. I like it. Finally, you look like a man. Until you, until you come back from shul, until you say, Aleinu l'shabeach, don't look at your phone. I mean, what could be? But Mashiach comes. Don't worry. You'll hear the, you'll hear the show from Bloy. Your wife, you just, you just left home. And it's an emergency. What can you do? Why are you a national guard? What are you going to do? Don't just leave the phone. Leave the phone until you're done davening. When you're davening at home, you're davening at shul, until you're done davening, don't touch your phone. We're going to check how many likes you have on Instagram. Don't worry, it's all fake. Why are you going to check? How many, uh, you know, what is it to check? The weather? Who cares about the weather? Always have a record in your car and have a, you know, you know, flat, you know, a, a match, you know, something to start a, you know, a lighter, raincoat, you're good, you're good for survival. You can survive for a little, many, even if you're stuck somewhere in, you know, the mountains, you, can, you know what I'm saying? Mr. Survival Guy over there. And the way it works, again, the way it works, the time slowly, slowly takes away your freedom, slowly, slowly takes away your freedom, but in order to come out of it, in order to really be free, we need to go into, and that's why Am Yisrael needed to go to Mitzrayim, in order to understand how precious freedom is. Otherwise, we don't appreciate it. And the same thing in this country. We forgot how good it is to be free. So much that we ask for more regulations. You know, I just saw something today. They find a... Uh, a uh, a prehistoric rhinoceros in, si in Siberia. A fairy rhinoceros in Siberia. I mean, well, you know, Siberia is pretty cold, but it was a rhinoceros there. I mean, this one time it was nice. Well, don't worry about the global warming, not global warming. It's a cycle that goes in the world. But you want more regulations. You want to be controlled. You don't want to have freedom. Why? Because you want to have all these little things. It's like instead of eating a steak, you're eating the crumbs on the table. Be free to whatever you want this way. And we need for therefore we need to understand that Bnei Israel had to go to Egypt in order to understand what freedom is and what true freedom is. And that's the whole, and that's why going out of Egypt is associated with receiving the Torah. You are not going to be free unless you receive the Torah. That's why the Israeli anthem is such a pathetic anthem. Because Liot, what? Liot am chov shi To be a free nation in our, in our land. A free nation, they meant free nation from Torah. A free nation is to be able to, we should live life of Torah. Live life as a Jew with no, with no things like this. It's not, and by the way, it's not just about sitting down and learning Torah all the long in yeshiva and so on and 